So we conclude our trilogy with Leah Greenfield, a professor, eminent professor of sociology, as we discuss yet another book and already classics in the field, The Spirit of Capitalism, Nationalism and Economic Growth, which answers a fundamental question of economics, a question neither economists nor economic historians have been able to answer. What are the reasons rather than just conditions for sustained economic growth? Let's get directly to the Book. Welcome back, Professor Greenfield, and good to have you here at our podcast again. Hello. So, in the spirit of capitalism, you explore the reasons behind sustained economic growth and argue that nationalism plays a significant role in this transformation. Can you briefly explain how nationalism serves as a primary motivation for the shift from subsistence to profit-oriented economies, and generally, what's the role of nationalism in this whole deal? Nationalism is behind the reorientation of uh, uh, the economy, of economic activity, from the orientation that existed before. Now, the, uh, all the pre-modern economies were oriented towards subsistence. This was a fundamentally rational orientation in the framework of various religious ethics. The rationality of it was that we need to sustain our bodies, we need to be alive in order to participate in whatever cosmic scheme, whatever um, religious uh, activity that was presumed. So, uh, there was no need in ethical justification of economic activity. So, pure rationality was enough. No need in any ethical justification. People worked in order to live, they accumulated wealth in order to live. When they reached a certain level of comfort, they stopped accumulating wealth and instead were spending it. As a result, the economy oscillated between periods of growth and periods of decline. There were such cycles of growth and decline, growth and decline. It was conceptualized in the um, beginning of the 19th century as Malthusian scissors. When the economy grew and prosperity therefore grew, more children survived to maturity. So there was a population growth. Then this increased population ate the surplus. 
it ate the surplus, and there was economic decline. And during the economic decline, fewer babies survived to maturity. So there also was a population decline. Then again, people accumulated more wealth because clearly there was not enough for them to survive. This was expressed in increased mortality, especially infant mortality. They, again, there was more productivity, the economy grew, more babies survived, the population grew, and then the cycle repeated itself. This is how it was everywhere before the age of nationalism. Then the nationalism, which emerged in England, as we talked before, in the 16th century, in fact, demoted God. Nationalism is a fundamentally secular worldview, a fundamentally secular consciousness. And though this doesn't at all imply abandonment of religion, this implies that God, in particular, becomes much less important. The so, while not implying the abandonment of religion, it fundamentally implies the abandonment of God. Religion, uh, on the other hand, may become an ethnic characteristic which is very different from uh, what it was uh, before nationalism. So uh, everything, the meaning of life now depended and, um, and uh, was created by this world, the mundane society. And, you, and you're talking about uh, very rich case studies, England, Netherlands, France, Germany, Japan, United States, which is yeah. fantastic analysis, yeah. detailed yeah. analysis. Can yeah. you share some insights? Uh, wait, 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 wait. I didn't uh, finish. Sure. So, uh, now, uh, Religious ethic now was not important. So, uh, what was important? Now, nationalism, as we talked, is a kind of uh, worldview or consciousness which endows every individual identity with dignity. Now, this is a new thing. No other consciousness endowed individual identity, personal identity in the monotheistic societies with dignity. Dignity was a luxury enjoyed only by the upper classes, very, very, very small percentage of the general population. But nationalism gives every person, every national, a sense of personal dignity. And because this personal dignity depends on the membership in the nation, national populations develop very strong commitment 
to the dignity of the nation as a whole. This makes nationalism a very competitive type of worldview or consciousness. And the competition between nations is always competition for dignity. Now, this competition takes place in, it can take place in any sphere of life. Now, uh, they can compete in any, any sphere, but was an individualistic nationalism. That is, uh, it expressed their um, interests and identities of the majority of the population, of the majority of individuals who compose the nation. And the majority of the nation, <clears throat> people who actually competed for the dignity of England, they competed without anyone competing with them, but they thought that all the other people were also nations and were also very competitive. So uh, the uh, natural activity for them, for the majority of individuals, was the economic activity. So therefore, England, to begin with, chose the economic sphere as the main sphere of the competition for the dignity of the nation. And this made the rationale for economic activity as such. So the economic activity was reoriented to serve the dignity of the nation. Well, before, it, it was simply rational activity for the upkeep of life. Now there was a new ethic, and this ethic was that, economic ethic, that your economic activity should contribute to the dignity of England. Now, how do you contribute to dignity? You contribute to dignity. Dignity, as you know, is a relative good. That is, the more you have of dignity, the less somebody else have, has. The more somebody else has, the less you have. So, in economics, this leads to sustained growth. This leads to the reorientation to constant growth. This orientation is fundamentally irrational from the point of view of the individual. You see, the individual does not uh, serve, does not increase pleasure through decreasing pain. The individual, in fact, works constantly, never reaching the point of satiation. The individual becomes a workaholic, never having the time to enjoy the fruits of one's labor. But there is now a different rationale. You see, what makes this activity rational is not the individual rationality, but the service of the dignity of the nation. So it started in England, and the English constantly believed that, aha, uh -huh, we have to have more and more wealth because what happens if suddenly the French have more wealth than us? If suddenly the Spaniards have more wealth than us? 
And in this way, competitiveness emerges as one of the main standards, main measures of the viability of the economy. Then for two centuries, England was the only nation. And of course, given that it had no competitors, it immediately outcompeted everyone else economically and emerged as the world's uh, supreme economy. It emerged as the, it was a very backward uh, and weak economy before that in comparison to much larger countries with much more resources such as France or Spain or whoever it actually competed with or uh, in comparison with a small uh, but uh, uh, very um, differently situated Netherlands. So when England emerged as unrivaled, strongest economy in the world, by the 18th century, other nations started developing nationalism. And of course, the model for them was England. And so they also reoriented, just in imitation of England, they also reoriented the economies, and that's how the modern economy emerged, which is distinguished from all other economies by the fact that unlike all other economies, which are oriented towards subsistence, modern economy is oriented towards growth and thus is characterized by sustained growth, constant growth. Uh, okay, yeah, this is the end of the answer to this question. Wow, fascinating. fascinating. And I think it leads me to a sort of a bro broader uh, a reference to the book which most of sociologists have in mind. And how does your perspective on the spirit of capitalism differ from Max Weber's famous study on the same subject in the ways does your work challenge or expand on Weber's ideas? Can you give a kind of um, a short yes. view of sure. uh, the listeners? Sure. You see, Weber was the first to understand that modern economy is a different kind of economy. Is uh, that there was a revolution, a revolution in the orientation of very large numbers of people because very large numbers of people participate in economic activity. And so he was the first to try and understand this transformation. Now, uh, he, he was also the first to clearly define ca defined capitalism. Capitalism, in fact, is defined strictly economically, strictly in economic terms, as an economy characterized by sustained growth, an economy oriented to growth in distinction to all other economies which are oriented towards uh, subsistence. It was Weber who first and who clearly defined capitalism. And uh, usually all the other definitions of capitalism, they're not empirical, they're simply political and ideological. And so they point to nothing and help to understand nothing. But Weber's definition is very, very empirical, logical, and this is what capitalism is. Now he wanted to explain that. Uh, how come the economy, economic activity was reoriented 
basically uh, at that time it was all over the western world all over the western world from uh, subsistence to uh, to um, growth and uh, he thought that when this happened, this basically corresponded in time to the Reformation, the uh, religious revolution, uh, the split of the Western church, and the emergence of Protestantism. Uh, so he tried to connect uh, this uh, reorientation on the individual level, he tried to connect it to uh, the um, doctrine of predestination in one type of Protestantism, the Calvinist Protestantism, which made the certitude of salvation uh, depend on... Uh, worldly success. So uh, people who are Calvinists, therefore, uh, and, and participated in economic activity, they would measure their success by profit, but there would never be enough profit for them because if today they were profitable, they cannot, could not stop being profitable since tomorrow they wouldn't have any certitude that God still considers them among the elect, that God still loves them and that they would be saved rather than go to hell. This applied very well to, uh, to the Calvinists, that is Puritans in England, but it didn't apply to any other cases. And even with Calvinism, there was a big problem. And this problem was the Netherlands, Holland. It was a problem. Why? Because the Dutch economy, which became a very powerful economy in the 17th century, did not become a capitalist economy, did not become the modern economy. It did not reorient itself to growth. And that's why it's extraordinary expansion from the end of the 16th century to the middle of the 17th century, extraordinary expansion. It was very successful. But this expansion was followed by contraction. So the growth of the that economy uh, in the golden age of the Dutch Republic was followed by a decline. Uh, so it was precisely like all the other economies oriented towards subsistence. Uh, and given that the Dutch Republic was also a Calvinist Republic, you see, Max Weber's explanation, specific explanation of why this orientation happened now didn't hold water altogether. It applied only to England and didn't apply anywhere else. For example, the French economy became very successful after uh, it became nationalist, but it was a Catholic society, right? So there was no predestination, nothing like that. Uh, other uh, Protestant denominations did not lead at all to. Um, to uh, 
an economy oriented to growth. But the most serious case against Weber's argument was the Netherlands, where you had Calvinism and still it didn't lead to growth. So while uh, I am um, building on Weber's question and Weber's definition of capitalism, <laughs> Sorry. And his general understanding of the cultural process, how it happens, you know, how we have to have a motivation to explain reorientation of activities. Therefore, we do need to find a new ethic to explain the new spirit, right? So his book is called The Spirit of Capitalism and, no, Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. So it is Protestant Ethic, which he discovers only in Calvinism and unfortunately doesn't pay any attention to the Netherlands, which leads to the reorientation. Structurally, uh, psychologically, this is a correct argument. Historically, it is an argument that has been definitively proven false. So uh, while taking this Weberian uh, position towards uh, the, the um, interrelationship between uh, ethics and motivation, uh, I had to completely change uh, to argue against him, against Weber, in actually finding what, in fact, produced this, um, this uh, reorientation to growth and this characteristic of sustained growth, and I did find it in nationalism. And because Weber committed such a mistake um, in disregarding, unfortunately, the, the case of the Netherlands, I paid a very, very, I started actually the um, analysis um, from the comparison between the Netherlands and England. Yeah, well, that gets us to an, a very American question. You argue that United States is an example of nation where economic activity has become the end all of political life and determinant of social progress. How do you think this unique relationship between nationalism and capitalism has shaped American society and its approach to economic and foreign policy? Um. Right. Uh, in in the United States, and this is the really this is the um, subject of uh, the two American chapters in in my book. Uh, in America, uh, the belief in the absolute necessity, absolute, independent of anything, necessity uh, of economic, necessity and naturalness of economic growth, um, and the belief that this activity is rational as such, you know, rational without any rationale, uh, really became, uh, I would say, a religion. It became a belief, a national faith. Um, and what happened, you you will remember in the very end of, uh, of uh, 
uh, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism in the very uh, last three pages. Um, Weber introduces uh, this uh, uh, concept, which is usually translated as the iron cage, that, you know, we start from, uh, according to his argument, um, we start from a fervent religious belief uh, and do all this uh, economic activity in order to gain the certainty of salvation. But in the end, this belief disappears from our eyes. And in this uh, new, already secular society, we are caught in the belief of the absolute necessity of profit and ever renewed profit as in an iron cage. So uh, the meaning of this activity disappears and it becomes kind of meaningless uh, workaholism. Now, this in fact did happen in the United States. Not only, uh, not as, as I write in those uh, two chapters on the United States, not only did they develop this, uh, Americans developed this absolutely religious belief in the necessity and naturalness of, uh, of economic growth, but they also developed a special theology uh, for this belief. And this is the science of economics, because the you know uh, this is what economics, the science is. It is a theology of this completely irrational belief, uh, and that's why so many people in the United States, among other things, they are they are working constantly. Uh, they um, and yet their life has no meaning, and they don't derive any enjoyment from their work. They don't derive any enjoyment from the accumulation of wealth. They're very prosperous, but their prosperity doesn't make them happier than in other societies, in fact, it makes them very, very unhappy. So this is one thing. On the other hand, the, while this developed as a religion, and in the end, even developed a theology of its own, and while we worship the economists in this uh, society as if they are the smartest of all people, even though they never ever have been empirically right in anything, uh, they they all the time make horrible mistakes. Nevertheless, whenever um, some other society is vying for the place of the superior leading modern economy, there is panic in the United States. And, and the United States considers its economic rivals as its existential rivals. So this, this happened, of course, with, the, with Japan, and now it is happening so very clearly with China. So uh, United States, you know, whenever it comes to the dignity of the nation, they still reach this idea that the dignity of the, the existence of the United States depends uh, on its economic superiority. This is not a part of their theology, but this remains a part of their psychology. Understand? So it's not 
the economists don't know how to deal with that. But psychologically, the Americans are still there. More than that, uh, Americans are, of course, tremendously competitive, economically competitive inside the country. Everyone is constantly trying to keep up with the Joneses. And this, among other things, is the cause of so much mental illness in the United States. So it is related, you see, to, to the other argument as well. This tremendous competitiveness. And most of this competitiveness is economic competitiveness. Uh, this tremendous competitiveness, this constant comparison between oneself and others um, is uh, certainly productive of those very high rates of mental disease the, in the United States that I discussed in Mind Modernity Madness. Which we also discussed in our previous episode. Which you also discussed, yeah. Um, who haven't listened to, please do. So as, as technology continues to advance so rapidly, we're witnessing the rise of the AI, artificial intelligence, automated, the automation, which could potentially reshape our economies and societies. How do you think these technological advancements might interact with or influence the relationship between nationalism, capitalism, and mental health, the three themes which you have extensively published on? If we start with nationalism, then um, the most important factor now in nationalism is not technology. The most important factor in nationalism now is China. China, which has acquired nationalism, developed nationalism in the last half a century, even less than last half a century, is now uh, very strongly devoted to competition for the stature, the prestige of the nation in the world. It is, of course, positioned now as the superior, as the great power the one great power, the only country that could assail and compete with China for the position of the great power is India, and India is not yet there. So it will take some time. What will happen when India will reach the uh, the ability to compete with China, uh, I don't know. But what we see now is that Chinese nationalism leads, I mean, uh, guarantees that nationalism as a consciousness as um, as a worldview with its very special psychological dynamics in the foreseeable future will be uh, will rule the world. So um, this is what is important. China is now committed to uh, um, capitalism as, you know, clearly defined as the economy characterized by sustained growth. And so long as China is committed to this capitalism or this type of the economy, will also exist, and this is in the foreseeable future. This could in include 
the new technologies and it could go on without the new technology. It would probably include the new technologies because they have become so very important from the military point of view, from the military and security point of view. It could completely uh, proceed this kind of uh, process, this kind of developments, capitalists and nationalists could completely proceed without the new technologies. What is clear in the United in the West is that those new technologies very much contribute to uh, growing rates of mental illness. They do. Remarkably, they do not contribute to growing rates of mental illness in the great Asian countries. So um, the rates of mental illness in Southeast Asia uh, are still remarkably low in comparison to those in the West. What can I predict? I don't know. I mean, uh, technology, you know, um, is like fashion. Now this is the last. Uh, scream of uh, our um, love affair with uh, smartphones and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. But I am reminded of uh, the firearms. You know, the creation of the firearms was uh, of tremendous importance, of course, uh, in warfare, and it made distance, uh, killing at a distance possible. Before that, you had to do it face to face. So uh, it was a very, very important invention. Uh, and among other things, it decided decided the um, um, warfare uh, and the victory uh, of different Japanese shoguns in the end of the 16th century decided the victory of the Tokugawa. Now they they became victorious because they used firearms. But having become victorious, they prohibited the use of firearms. And Japan in the next two centuries, two centuries, yes, three centuries, yeah, basically, and uh, for the next uh, quarter of a millennium, didn't have firearms, even though they existed, but they didn't exist in Japan. So, uh, we don't know what China will do in regard to all this artificial intelligence. So, uh, the fate of that would depend on China's policies. Uh, I have no, absolutely no doubt that very soon China will control the world. And, uh, and then the fate of technology uh, would be very much uh, at the mercy of uh, of Chinese decisions, just like the fate of firearms in Japan was at the at the hands of the Tokugawa um, shoguns. Well, what a, what a journey it was um, to 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 talk 
uh, to you and to listen. Um, so we will finish here. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening journey, Professor Greenfield. We can't you thank you enough. It's incredible that you spent time with our listeners through these three episodes. And we look forward to uh, bringing uh, more engaging conversations with the world's top experts on the future episodes of Religion in Praxis. Until then, take care and stay curious. Thank you.